worship and, and gathering with others is really just the hosannas of today with the palms and the hallelujahs of resurrection on Easter Sunday. But we mustn't forget, friends, that there are also very important days, dark days, when Jesus walks between those two joyous peaks. Days that we must remember and similarly walk alongside of him. So that is what we're going to do today in this special service, this service of parade and passion, where we will lean into this duality, engaging ourselves in the stories of both Jesus' triumphant entry into the city, filled with shouts of praise by the crowds, but we will also journey into the city, excuse me, into the streets of Jerusalem, as many of those same crowds would call for his death. So today is a service of remembrance, a journey that sees us processing not only the route of a parade, but also the final steps of the greatest passion story ever told. So let us, friends, begin this journey together today. Let us pray. God of the foolish cross. Tottering down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey, you were not the Savior that we expected. Your power doesn't look like the power that we want our God to demonstrate. Your wisdom makes no sense to us. We are happy to join the crowd waving branches, but not so sure that we want to follow you, to follow you into the temple courts and to the upper room and to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the foot of the cross. God, forgive our false assumptions. Clarify our clouded vision. Let us relax into the foolishness of your love, your grace. Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us. Join us this day as we celebrate as those who cheered you as king and as we remember those who ridiculed you as a criminal. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, we pray. Amen. We'll begin with a reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, first 10 verses. I'll be using the New Revised Standard Version. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These are the words of Holy Scripture. Please join me in the call to praise printed in your order of worship. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow, for he is the life we long for. He is the word that sustains us. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humanity and obedience for all of us.
please join me now in singing hymn number 265, All Glory, Loud, and Honor. Please stand as you're able as we sing hymn number 265. Well, good morning. I'm so thrilled to see each and every one of you this morning on Palm Sunday. And you did a wonderful job walking around our sanctuary and waving the palms, just like people did thousands of years ago when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. They were excited to see him, so they waved palm branches. Like today, we would wave flags in a parade. They waved palm branches. They even took their robes off and laid it down in front of Jesus as he rode by on a young donkey. 
and they were excited to see him because they thought he had come to save them. He had thought, they thought he had come to save them like an earthly king. They wanted him to save them from the Romans, to help them rise up and throw the Roman government over. But is that why Jesus came? No, Jesus came for a different purpose. So I have a donkey up here, and to remind us, of course, that don Jesus rode in on a donkey uh, in Jerusalem, but also to make a point about our faith. Now, this is donkey. It does sort of look like a horse, but it's a donkey. This also is a game, and it's a game that I used to play when I was little. And I bet there's people out in this audience that they played it too when they were little. When they went to a birthday party, they played pin the tail on the... That's right. Now, I wish I had time for everyone to play pin the tail on the donkey. That would be fun. But then if we did that... Reverend Josh wouldn't get his sermon preached, and you wouldn't get to that Easter egg hunt. So we're only going to pick two to play this morning, but I will send the game back with those who go in the back, and they can play it, and I'll bring it on Wednesday night later, and y'all can play it then. Okay, I'm going to pick Quinn, and I'm going to pick Mark. Now, Mark, I'm going to start with you if you'll stand up. Now, Mark, when we played it, you, had, you were blindfolded. So I'm going to put this over. Okay. And then I'm going to give you a tail. Hold the tail by the tape so you know you've got the tape ready to go. You got it? You have it? You got it? Okay, that's good. Okay, all right, now I'm going to spin you around. Spin around. Now, we're going to help him because he can't see. So we're going to yell and tell him what to do. Okay, now you got to find that donkey, and you got to pin that tail on that donkey. Okay, and go. All right, here we go. Go find that donkey. Pin the tail. First thing you touch, turn around. Go the other way. Turn, turn back. Go to your right. Go to your right. Keep going. Keep going. Go ahead. Stick it on. Yay. But do we give him a good hand and say, good job. That was a really good job, Mark. Thank you so much. All right, now, Quinn, I'm going to let you go this time. And we're going to play it a little different. Stand up. Now, everybody's going to cheer her on, too, and tell her a good job. Now, Quinn, stand back there. Grab it by the tape. Now, I want you to pin that tail on that donkey. Do you know where it goes? Okay, go put it on. Wow, she hit the mark, didn't she? Good job, Quinn. Thank you. Have a seat. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I played it different, didn't I? And I did that to make a point. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he was very focused. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. He knew that he had to come and suffer. He knew he had to come and die and be crucified and rise again and defeat death so that we too can also have everlasting life. He was very focused. No matter what the crowd was cheering and yelling about, he knew what he had to accomplish. And as we as Christians, and that was just like Quinn, she went straight forward. But Mark, it was very confusing, wasn't it, Mark? People were yelling and screaming, telling him one thing, do this, telling him something else. And so didn't quite hit the mark, did he? And so as Christians, we need to stay focused, keep our faith focused on Jesus and be like Jesus. Did Jesus share? Yes. Did Jesus care for all people? Did Jesus help all people? Did Jesus love all people? And did Jesus forgive all people? Yes. And so that's how we need to keep our faith. So now I have, and when we say a prayer, a little treat for you. Uh, to uh, enjoy, but I do hope that this week you keep your faith and focused on who? Jesus. Very good. Let's bow our hands, bow our heads and put your hands together. Dev Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this beautiful day to celebrate your entry into Jesus. And we pray that this week we will stay focused on you and what you did for us to die for us, to save us from our sins, that we too may have eternal life. 
We pray that we will be loving, we will be caring, we will be sharing, and we will help all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May we pray. Almighty God, walk with us on this journey from palms to passion. Forgive us, for we have praised your son some days and betrayed him on many others. We see ourselves in the actions and failures of Peter, Pilate, and Judas. For this we repent. Let us not betray you due to our fear, our greed, our anger, or our indifference. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, much like today has been, the last few weeks have been a busy time in the life of our church, but also in the life of our community. As the days become longer and a little warmer, 
We find ourselves with a little fuller calendar, don't we? The budding flowers beckon us to go outside. The rays of sunshine call us to linger a little bit more. And with the winding down of school and the church year, there are typical things that happen in this time to culminate the end of a season in one's life. And so we are very familiar with having to move from one thing to the next, quickly going from this to that, addressing this responsibility before lightning fast, we are on to the next thing that we've got to get done. That kind of frequency and, and quickness is just a normal part of so many of our lives today. And in very much a similar way, the stories of Jesus that we've been hearing from Mark's gospel over the last few weeks of this Lenten season find us moving quickly from one event to the next. Mark's author is known for their brevity, quite fond of the use of the word immediately, condensing long periods of Jesus' life, such as the 40 days of temptation in the desert, to just a handful of words in a sentence. Yet in light of this agile nature in this account of Jesus' life in Mark's gospel, Maybe it's what they choose to do with the final few days of Jesus' life that should really cause us to stop and think a little more, to sit a while with what we are encountering. You see, where the majority of Mark's perspective may be light on the details in regards to so many other things in Jesus' life, when it comes to Jesus' final days, however, in particular the passion narrative, well, Mark is quite detailed, arguably as much as any of the other three gospel perspectives. In Mark's recordings, we see the writer stretching out the details of what Jesus tells his disciples, recounting the heartbreaking denial of some of his followers, choosing to offer up unique details like the names of Simon the Cyrene's son who carried the cross of Jesus. And of course, Mark gives necessary attention to the prolonged punishment of our Lord in his final moments. You know, in the Easter celebration of our lives, it's easy to want to jump from the celebration of Palm Sunday to the joyous resurrection of Easter. You know, because there is still life that happens between those two Sundays for us today, it sometimes is easy to miss what Jesus endured in those in-between days. Sure, life happened. Jesus broke bread with his friends, experienced frustration at, at a once-trusted institution that was now corrupted. He said goodbyes. He experienced anxiety, and he asked God for a different way if it was possible. He endured physical pain, and yes, even succumbed to death. Yes, a lot of life happened in those in-between days for Jesus. And a lot of what Jesus experienced in those days are very similar to some of what we experience in our life as well. Some of us even wrestling with these things now. And that is why Holy Week these days ahead of us, and the corresponding practices of the church and the biblical narrative are vital for us to hear once more again this year. Now, while it may not be practical to gather corporately in services like we're going to have the chance to do with our sister congregations this week, I think it's still important for us to remember all that Jesus endured, to sit a while with the fullness of the life experience that was crammed into just those handful of days for him. And not just briefly mention them and move on to the other fun parts of this season. So yes, friends, today we're going to take the opportunity to sit just a little while with the experiences of our Lord. As we now turn the page, so to speak, from the joyous parade of Jesus' triumphant entry, we now turn to hear Mark's account of those in-between days in its fullest. And as we make this mark, as we make this turn to hear this story once more, 
I want to invite you all to reflect deeply on the various experiences that Jesus endured. To reflect on all of the emotional, relational, spiritual, and physical turmoil that our Lord endured. In so doing, may we acknowledge today that we too have endured many of these same things in our lives. And maybe are even experiencing today. But let us also find encouragement, friends, in knowing that we are not alone in these experiences. That it is our Lord who has endured. The Lord who endured so much for us has also chosen to endure our pain alongside of us. So let us sit a while with the pain, knowing that it is only temporary. Let us taste just a sip of the agony because it is only with the bitterness in our mouths that we can appreciate the fullness of the cup of hope, life, and resurrection that our Lord brings. So let us hear this journey with our Lord once more today. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one? He replied, it is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave it and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it, new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. These are the words of scripture of God. Thanks be to God. Let's join in singing the first stanza of hymn number 277, My Savior's Love.
On the way, Jesus told them, All of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, Even if everyone deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that you even know, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter said emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him and became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus said to them again, then Jesus left them again, and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they could not keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But know the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up. Let's be going. Look, the betrayer is here. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priest, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. Then you can take him, (laughs) you will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Jesus walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what scriptures say about me. Then all of his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only with a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. The words of the Lord.
Let's sing the second stanza together. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at the distance and went right through the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priest and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many false witness, witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, when some men stood up and gave this false testimony, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds to heaven, of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show this to show this horror and said, why do we need another witness? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit at him and they, um, they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophecy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, This man is definitely one of them, but Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them, because you are a Gal Galilean. Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. But suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that even know me. And he broke down and wept.
presentation to Pilate. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priests kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked them, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, any one the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews, Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, Crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and toned, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Number 283, were you there? A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine, drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. And then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to the side who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law 
also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. Stanza two. Now let us hear the conclusion of this passion narrative. After I read, I'm going to ask that you remain seated as we sing the final verse of Were You There? And then after we conclude that song, I'm going to invite you to sit quietly and in your own reflection as we process the story that we have heard again this morning. Let's hear the conclusion from Mark's gospel. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbagdani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of the men from fear approached with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man was truly the Son of God. Some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate took, told Jesus, Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth, and he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid.
Holy God, as we have celebrated your kingship, we have also acknowledged your suffering. We have remembered your passion, that trying experience that you went through in order that there may be victory over death. God, we remember your love. We remember your sacrifice. And God, as we make this journey through this holiest of weeks, may we remember all that you are, all that you have done for us, all that you have carried for us, all that you have endured alongside of us. May we sit with your agony until we receive the joy's resurrection. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so, friends, as we have gathered today, we know that this is just the start of the story for our Savior as he made his journey to the cross. We have reenacted it today. We will reenact it throughout this week. And as you go through the busyness of these next few days, I want to challenge you to remember our Lord and Savior each day. And so as we prepare to depart today, we're going to end with this closing litany. I would encourage you to take it with you, maybe put it somewhere that you can see it. And you can remember each day and reflect on what our Lord did as he made his journey to the cross and to ultimately what would be his glorious resurrection. So I invite you to stand with me as you are able to stand in spirit as we will end our time today with this closing litany. And then I will offer a brief word of prayer and some instructions about how to to go to lunch. So join me in our closing affirmation today. God, today we have cheered you on as our champion and held you as our hero. Today we have entrusted you to rescue us from pitiful circumstances. Today we have made you the centerpiece of our very existence. Today, we have called out to you loudly by name. Today, we have stared at you with the starstruck eyes of fans and groupies. Today, we have experienced, expressed our unsuppressed hopefulness in the future that you have in store for us. Today, we have been boldly certain of the earthly ways you will redeem us. Amen. And so as uh, I offer this final prayer here in just a moment, I'm going to encourage you to uh, make your way down to our fellowship hall for lunch. You can go through this door and turn back to your right and go down the hallway. Or if you want to uh, get a taste of the briskness outside this morning to wake you up, you can go out that door and take a left under the portico and go down the steps to the fellowship hall. Either way you would like, uh, enjoy your time together today as we fellowship around the table with one with another and good food. Uh, and celebrate the the Easter season as our young people uh, engage in their egg hunt. And so I encourage you to take a peek outside when they go out to that and enjoy that as well. Enjoy our time together today as a church fellowship. So as we prepare to depart this place, let me offer this word of prayer and benediction as we go. Gracious God, thank you for today. Yes, we have celebrated the joys of this day, but also been reminded of the pain that is still yet to come. God, what a testimony to life as we experience the highs and lows of the human experience, but Lord, we know that you too experience those same highs and lows, and you experience them, walk alongside of us in them each and every day. And so God, go with us into this week as we reflect and remember those final days of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. And may we remember all that he means, all that he has done, and all the ways that he has loved us. But God, now as we go to partake of this meal, I ask that you would bless it. May it strengthen and nourish our bodies and our bodies to your service. Bless the hands that have prepared it, and bless our time of fellowship and community together. It's in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen. Peace.